All right, welcome to the first session on the Divine Council at the MBI graduation 2023. That sounds so strange because every time I do that, I want to go, welcome to our study on the book of Romans. <laughs> I, I just can't get that out of my head. You know, when you change years, do you ever write the old year date? This is me. I've been in Romans half of my life, and now I can't get that out of my head. So this is a bare bones. We are going to post this, make it available for everybody. And, um, and so I just want to start out by saying that where the manifest presence of God is in the third heaven, there is a divine council. Now we're going to learn some other names for it. We'll see these in the scriptures. I apologize that if you can't sit, this isn't big enough. But again, if you want those notes, we'll, we'll, we'll give them to you and hand them out. But this council can, right now consists of the heavenly host. Now I'm going to give you bits and pieces of this as we go along. But the council does not have any members of the spirit realm that rebelled against God. So the first thing to get in your mind is the divine council is all of the good guys. The other thing to get in your mind is that some of the bad guys who have rebelled used to be on the council. So that will kind of set the stage for where we're going here because at the end of this, when I show you the things that we're going to look at in the Bible about the divine council, what I want you to understand is at the end, we are going to replace the heavenly host in the creature and filled this role in this, in this assembly that God is going to utilize to carry out his business throughout the ages to come. Pretty exciting stuff. So if you're looking at this and going, well, you're, you're talking a lot about cherubim and angels and all that stuff. Yeah, but I'm going to be describing a job that you're going to be doing. And so to get that started, what I'm going to do is take you over, and I'll show you this on the PowerPoint, but if you have trouble seeing it and you have your Bible might want to turn over to 1 Kings chapter 22. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you the background to this. We've read through this before, so I think we can work through this pretty quickly. And that is we're going to take an up-close look at the divine council and the heavenly hosts that are up there with, with the Lord. The context to this is on the earth there's been a continual conflict between the northern kingdom, now remember after the death of Solomon, the kingdom divides, remember you have the northern kingdom of Israel, ten tribes, southern kingdom of Judah, that's two tribes, and the northern kingdom has had an ongoing conflict that's been hot and cold with Syria. So if, if I just really need this whiteboard. Uh, so pretend I'm drawing the land of Israel like you've seen me do a hundred times. And up here you have the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River comes down, the Dead Sea down here. On the other side of the Dead Sea, I have a picture. On the one on the left, you can see, on the, on the other side of the Jordan River, you'll see Ramoth Gilead. You see that? That's an area that was controlled by the northern kingdom of Israel and then Syria took it over. So they've had this battle going on uh, back and forth. And, uh, and now at the time that we're looking at in 1 Kings, there's been kind of a ceasefire for three years. Ahab, who is the king of the northern uh, tribes, is upset about the fact that Ramoth Gilead is not under his control anymore. He wants it back. But in order to get it back, he figures he needs some help. So he contacts Jehoshaphat, who is the king of the southern kingdom. And he says, will you go with me up to Ramoth Gilead and help me take this back? And so they do that. So you're looking at a couple of things here. So I, and I apologize. I know that's not coming out quite as big as I was hoping it would. But anyway, you get the idea of where this action is taking place. In 1 Kings 22, you're going to see the things that are happening in the background. In other words, you're going to see the spiritual end 
of what's going on in connection with this event on the earth where Ahab wants to go back and do that. Now, here's the thing. Uh, God has declared, he has decided that it is time for Ahab to die. Ahab's a bad guy. And uh, one of the worst. And so because of that, God has determined that it's time for him to die. And because God is omniscient. Now what does that mean? It means that God not only knows everything that is real and true. But he also knows all possible futures whether they take place or not. And you say, well, if it never took place, then it... Ne but, but we're going to read some other passages in which you're going to see that really is the case. All right. And so God wants this to happen. And what you're going to see here is God is going to go before his divine counsel. And we call it his divine counsel because it's his. So God's going to go before his counsel and he's going to say... It's time for Ahab to go. How are we going to do this? And here's because God is omniscient and he knows everything. He knows that if he can get Ahab to go to Ramoth Gilead, he will die in that battle. And so God said, and that's a very interesting thing to me because when I'm studying this, I'm thinking, you're God after all. Just give the guy a heart attack. Why do you need to entice him to do anything? Just kill him. But God has a way in which he is doing things in a very particular way. Now, to me, that's very interesting. I'd love to have that discussion, but i got to stay on track. All right. So God knows if he goes up there, and, and I can't help and say it. By the way, Ahab is going to get a, a, a heads up that, that he's in danger he actually goes into this very elaborate scheme to disguise himself so that they won't be looking for him. And he talks Jehoshaphat into dressing up like him. And he still dies. <laughs> and, it's, and God knows how all the I mean, that's what I'm saying. God knows it all. So let's read this now. Are you with me? 1 Kings 22, I've got it on the PowerPoint, and I'll try to take it up. So here we go. Starting in verse 3. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? Take it, I, I don't know why that's in there twice. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Now you understand what's going on here, right? Uh, Ahab has his advisors and he goes, do we go up and do this? And they go, oh yeah, you're great. It'll all be, you'll get it. It's going to be wonderful. Nobody can stop you. But Jehoshaphat knows I need, and I love what's about to happen next. I can't get it out of my head. Because he goes, don't you have a prophet of the Lord here? And Ahab is going to say, yeah, but I hate that guy. Because he never says anything good about me. Do you wonder why? So let's read it. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, hasten hither Micaiah, the, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, 
and all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chenanah, uh, and made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, With these thou shalt push the Syrians until they have consumed them. You understand what's going on here? They're doing this big elaborate display and saying, Oh, this is how it's going to happen. You're going to go, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Okay. Verse 15, so he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go up against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, when you look at that, you get the idea that he's just repeating what the others have said. But he's mocking the king. And it's so obvious that when he says it, Ahab knows instantly. So look what follows, verse 16. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? What makes him think that he didn't get told the truth? Yeah, because he's telling him what he wanted to hear. And you know what he's saying? This is too good to be true. How many times do I have to tell you, tell me the truth? Verse 17, he said... I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. You understand what that's saying? You're going to be dead. Your army is going to be scattered. They're just going to go back home. It's going to be over. Now that's the short answer right there. But we have to keep reading. And the king of Israel said to Josaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he said, here, there, and and by the way, this is Micaiah, this is very sobering now. It's like Micaiah quits being sarcastic and now he says very soberly, and he said, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said to him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And he said, because God is omniscient and he knows all things which are right and true, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. So he doesn't pull any punches at the end, right? And so he knows that this is what's going to be happening. Now Ahab hears this, but you know what he thinks. Now, I'm not really interested in the rest of the story. What I'm really after is the divine counsel. But Ahab thinks it doesn't really matter what the prophet said. I think I have a workaround. And that's the way people always get in trouble. So, okay. Now, this is a great picture of the divine counsel at work. Does God need, did God really need someone to give him a good idea? No, because he already knew. But the relationship that this council has with God is that they are a full partner in what is going on. Do you remember the skill of judgment? Now, this is why I love talking to a crowd like this because I can bring these kind of things in. You understand. You remember the difference between justice and judgment. Justice was that idea of choosing between good and evil, right and wrong. But when you come to judgment, remember, now you're making a decision between options that none of them are necessarily wrong, 
but, you're ju- but now you're making a judgment decision on which one you're going to do. Would there have been more than one way for this to end with Ahab? Maybe, but when this one spirit comes up and says, here's what I'll do, and the Lord says, yep, that's going to work, go do that, then this is actually being carried out in real time. So when, remember, long ago, I didn't understand everything I know now about it, but long ago, remember I told you that one day, fully educated sons will be sitting at the table. Okay, I think I got that part wrong. I don't think a table is going to hold them all. Or it's going to be a really long table. I, but... I said, we'll all be sitting at the table and our Heavenly Father might look down the table and say, based on what we've done so far, Gloria, what are we going to do next? And as a fully educated daughter, then Gloria would go, well, you know what? I think because we just got through doing this, I think the next natural thing, Lord, is for us to do that. And then our Heavenly Father would go, that's exactly what I was thinking, Gloria. Okay. (laughs) Well, it's Gloria, so he might be going... Sit down, Gloria. Let me. Who else has got an idea? Okay. Somebody accused me of picking on Gloria. I just wanted to earn the rep, okay? So he says, That's exactly what I was thinking, Gloria. That's a great idea. And he'll look at all the sons and daughters and go, Let's go make that happen. Now you're looking at that, and if that scares you a little bit, good. Because you're only through the book of Romans. Right? But this is the partnership that we're engaging in here with our Heavenly Father. Okay, so now i got to give you some background. So let me go through these in a big hurry. There have been three, look, there have been three human slash cosmic rebellions that have actually now created the kind of world that we live in and when people look around the world and say how come the world's in the condition it's in where does all that evil come from why are things the way they are why is it so terrible people always do that why is a kind and loving all-powerful God you know you know all of that kind of business but look you can say how did we get to where we are well first of all God didn't do that that got done through this human slash cosmic and when I say cosmic I'm being supernatural beings. So this combination of rebellions, and there's three of them. The first one that everybody would give an answer to, well, the world's in the condition it's in because of uh, the fall. Well, we do know that Lucifer fell, right? So I just need to talk to you about some of these things, so I'm going to bring this up here on the PowerPoint. But we know that Lucifer fell at some point he gets lifted up with pride. He decide, Now, by the way, he, he is the, uh, well, let me just give you the verse. So let's just do it and then we'll talk about it. Ezekiel 28, 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Now, I know this is in connection with the throne, right? But you understand what a cherub and a seraph are. Cherubim and seraphim are those, are those uh, uh, we would call them angels, But really, now, from this point forward, I would like for us to start refining our terminology now to include the whole cast of characters because, and and we're going to learn this, I don't know how far we'll get today, but we'll see. There's a whole host of good guys, and they're not all just angels, and there's a whole cast of bad guys, and they're all not just devils. There's more to that. So let me give you a little background. We look at these things about cherubim and seraphim. Those are throne guardians. That's a job description. And so they have a particular, uh, they, have a, they have a task at their, prefer- I'm not, someone says, well, wait a minute. Why does God need bodyguards? That, that's not what that is. These throne guardians are there to protect holy spaces from being defiled. So there's a whole thing with that. This comes out, that word, by the way, cherubim, comes out of an Akkadian word that means dragon serpent. 
So when you get up into the Babylonian area where the cherub, that's how they would talk, talk, talk about the throne guardian, it's always pictured as a dragon. But when you do that in Egyptian, their word is seraphim. And that throne guardian is depicted as a serpent. Well, guess what Lucifer is depicted as in your Bible? That old, that, that great dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. You remember that over in Revelation. So he's got all of that. So you know what that is? That, but that, that's what a cherubim and a seraphim were. That's a, and by the way, angel is another thing. We think, oh, that's an angel. But an angel, that, that means he's a messenger. That's a job description. When you see principalities and powers, you know what those are? That is a, that is a, uh, that's a rulership description. In other words, that's a position that they hold in the hierarchy. So there's a lot of different terms, and we're going to go through a bunch of those, but as we go, so I'm just saying, so he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covered. So he is a cherub, which means he's a throne guardian, which means he's protecting this sacred space from being defiled. That's his job description. But he's part of the divine council. Now, in this divine council, you understand, now there's something going on here. And he says, I've set thee so, thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, when you look, oh, you know what? I really wanted to talk about this, but I had to pick and choose what we're going to do. So I'll do a bare bones on this sometime. But you do realize that when he's talking about the mountain of God, that is the mount of the assembly. You know what that means? That's the mountain where the council meets. When we get into the heavenly places, that's still going to be the meeting place. What did you think God was going to do? Close down the third heaven and put a for rent sign up when he finally moves with the new Jerusalem to the earth? No, see, so there's going to be divine council meetings and it's, going to, it's still going to be there on Mount Zion. It's just that Mount Zion, right? By the way, Israel will have council meetings too. Guess where theirs is going to be? Earthly Mount Zion. It's the mountain, right? What do you, what do you, what do you associate that with? The temple of the Lord, and the, uh, the temple and the presence of God, right? And there's no, there's no temple over there now, but they still equate that with the presence of God. So that's the holy mount, right? But all of that has a future over there. And so does that. And you've walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Yes, you will. Because that's talking about the place where the council meeting. Did you ever wonder about that? Oh, you didn't? Well, I guess I won't do the bare bones on it. Okay. So, all right. So, he's talking about this council meeting place that's up there. And, um, and so now, of course, Lucifer, he falls. He gets lifted up. You already know about that, so I had to talk about it. Comes into the garden. Now, you understand. Um, I'm trying to think how much to talk about this here. He comes into the garden. We know about the temptation of Eve and all of that kind of business. Look, I have gotten sidetracked before. You see things in the Bible, and then you hear somebody say something, you know, somebody that's written about it, you read what they wrote or you hear what they say and all, and it kind of gets you off track and makes you think another way. So, you know what, so here's the serpent. The serpent is in the garden. You have to understand what is happening in Genesis is not a lesson in zoology. We forget that we're supposed to be seeing something else. So we, we look at it in our culture. So we look at it from our standpoint. But when a literate, when Ezekiel writes, what is he? He's 100 years before the second temple. So a, a literate second temple Israelite, if he was reading in Genesis, you know what he would look at? A serpent that was talking to Eve... He would not look at that and go, wow, I guess the snakes used to talk. He would look at that and he would go, there's something supernatural happening here. 
This is not the normal thing. But see, I, I, you know, there was a, I, I look at that and I go, ooh, okay, so how many animals were talking? Then your mind runs over and goes, well, Balaam's donkey talk. But, but see, that wasn't the rule either, right? The whole idea here is that but it, it, people get confused. Well, if it was Satan, why does it say serpent? Because, you're, because here's what an Israelite would understand. This is a supernatural being, and it's a bad guy. Because the Bible never calls it Satan in the Genesis account. It just says the serpent. But you get that serpent language again later in Revelation where it does connect it with Satan, right? You see, an Israelite would get that from the beginning because he's looking at it through the culture that that is written for. Okay, so you've got that. So this conversation that's taking place is not, it's not meant for you to say it's this snake talking to her but it's a supernatural being that's talking to her. All right, now that may be too much for everybody at this point, but I'm trying to get you to see that if you'll start to look at your Bible and understand there's something going on that's kind of behind an earthbound literalism, there is a bigger story going on behind that and sometimes we over literal I'm a literalist in other words I do take the Bible literally but sometimes we get so focused on the literal connection of it that we that we pass over the big story altogether uh, after uh, this next Tuesday when I go to Glen Rose because of all the confusion that happens in the world uh, I'm going to do a study on both sessions on Gog and Magog and straighten that out once and for all. Because nobody has ever straightened that out. I don't know what to say. But I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, you know what, we just need to get that straight. Because remember back when Russia invaded Ukraine, everybody, every preacher turned into a prophecy preacher, and now suddenly these prophecies are being fulfilled in the dispensation of grace and blah blah blah. And we know better than that. But not only that, but they're they got a newspaper in one hand and their Bible in the other hand, and they're trying to show you this is what was happening here. Well, first of all, Gog, and Ma- Gog is not, that's not about Russia at all. I will show you where that came from and how you know that. The Bible in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is going to tell you exactly where that comes from. The companion passage that is going to be over in Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to solve all that, all that out. And at least you'll be clear in your mind. Here's the other good thing about that. This will be a concise tool that if you're ever talking to somebody about Bible prophecy... You could just say, hey, watch this video, and then we'll talk about it. And so you let me do all that heavy lifting about the prophecy stuff, and then you can come back and clean it all up. And you say, well, how do I get them the video? And she'll email them the link <laughs> out of Dropbox. From this point forward, can I just say, when I ask you that rhetorical question, I'll just go, you know. Okay. So you've got the fall. Now, the Messiah is going to have to fix all of these, right? So the Messiah is going to fix the fall. How does he do that? You already know the answer to this. How does he fix the fall? Because what happens to us? We become estranged from, from God, and now we're going to die. That's the two big elements. What's the? Yeah, that's right. The fulfillment of the first mandate of the Davidic covenant where Jesus uh, dies on the cross and performs the redemption, right? He's the redeemer. And so that solves that one. Here's the second one, Genesis chapter 6. Let's read about it. I know you know about it. We've read this before, but we'll... Verse 1, it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took of them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit not always strive with man, for all, he also his flesh as his days shall be 120 years. And there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
When you read those verses, and I know I read through them very quickly, but most of us are familiar with this, right? Here's the thing. Do you notice that verse 5, it looks like a disconnect from the first four verses. And when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, remember all of that. And then you come down to verse 4, there are giants on the earth in those days when the sons of God came in on the daughters of men, they bare children to them. And then, God, and then because this whole thing is about the sons of God, right, and what they're doing. And then in verse 5 it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and the imagination of his heart was only evil continually. And then what's going to happen? The flood. And you're looking at that and you're going like, wow, we had this... Uh, topic change from verse 4 to verse 5 but not really so I just need to say this in a very succinct way what happened was on that okay every, every when this happens you have sons of God in your Bible in the Old Testament look we get used to sons of God in the New Testament and we think that's talking about believers humans who have you know believed the truth but in the Old Testament testament that's not about believers this is sons of god is a rank of people in a hierarchy of people who are in god's divine counsel and guess what we have been made to be sons of god and that's because you're being prepped, prepared, educated, equipped to fill those places. So you got sons, and so here's what the sons of God do. They look down, now by the way, I didn't talk about this, but I think you all know, Satan hates mankind. He's uh, furious over the fact that mankind's going to be given dominion over the earth, and they're going to be partners with God. The whole idea of the fall was to get God to wipe them out. But you know what? It is a surprise to him because instead of God going, Oh, you guys did what? And they're gone. He goes, You know what? It's okay. I've got a plan of redemption. And Satan's going, Wait, what? You have a plan of redemption? He didn't see that one coming. Now you've got these sons of God who are saying, you know what? Oh, no, there's a whole thing here. I'm skipping around in my head because I know the clock is ticking on me. So let me just throw this in. The divine counsel is in more places in your Bible than you think it is. So let me run you back over to Genesis to the creation account. When God says, let us make man in our image, let me tell you what he's doing. He's not talking to the other members of the Godhead. He's talking to the members of the divine council to inform them about what he is about to do. Because it moves from, let us make... You say, how do you know that, Mike? Because every member of the Godhead is co-equal, yes? They're all omniscient, yes? One member of the Godhead doesn't say to another member, hey, let's go do this, because they'd be going, I was already thinking that. In fact, I thought about it at the same time you thought about it. They don't need to say that to each other. But he's letting the members of the divine councils know, this is what we're fixing to do. The Psalms records... That the sons of God shouted for joy, remember, at the creation? And the morning stars, that's another part of the council, sang together. Don't over-literalize this. This is talking about members of the spirit realm that hold offices in the divine council. And so what you have in Genesis before you even know about it, is that God saying to them, hey, here's what, let's, let's go do this. And you might say, well, wait a minute, though. How did they get involved? How did they get involved in that? Because the Bible says, and God created man in his, singular, right, in his image. So how did they get involved? But you understand the council's involved in everything. I'll show you verses before we're through here that even the giving of the law of Moses 
was by ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So are they involved? Yeah. They're involved in how much? They're involved in everything. When you get in that council, you're going to be involved in what? Everything. Not only that, but you've got some specific jobs to do too. We'll talk about that when we get to this third rebellion. All right, so we're back to the Genesis 6 thing. And so when you get into Genesis 6 and you see this, here's why, here's why verse, those first four verses and verse 5 are connected. Look, not in your Bible. The Bi oh, how do I say this? In Second Temple Jewish literature, they are talking about things that the Bible writers refer to but they only talk, of, the Bible writers only, they assume you already know some things that is common knowledge for people at that time. The account of the flood, have you ever heard preachers talk about, there are accounts of the flood in Mesopotamian literature, and there's accounts of the flood and this literature and all, all those, they've all got their flood account and all that. That's true. That, that is true. But what they don't tell you is, in the Mesopotamian literature, you know what they have? Is they have a supreme God who is Baal, Baal. And, and he's got this whole hierarchy. And the God of Israel in that story is actually one of the created gods who has his own thing going. And what those Christians, no Christians back then, but you know what those Israelites believe is their God has given them this false story that he's the only God when really he's just way down the pecking order. The biblical writers come along and they correct all of that by telling you that there is no one like the God of Israel. And so they don't spend, they don't, and, and, and so what they're doing is they're, yeah, they have a flood account, but the flood account in the Mesopotamian literature wasn't brought about by Yahweh, was brought about by Baal. And it was for a whole different purpose. And the biblical writers are going, yeah. okay, here's what happened. And they're straightening out the story. But see, if you don't know that, you look at that sometimes and you go, and so, and then the New Testament becomes the inspired commentary on the events in the Old Testament. You read back here, but then when you get over, say, to 1st and 2nd Peter, they're giving you details that weren't in the story back here. How did they know about that? Well, I mean, it's, the, it's inspired scripture, right? I mean, God's giving them information that, you know, that, but... And that information is coming from somewhere, but, but, but the whole point is to say that there's, a, there's an understanding in, a, in, the, in the mind of a Second Temple Israelite that is not in the mind of Americans in the 21st century. Now, here's the, so here's, let me take all that Second Temple literature and pile it into a deal. 200 of those sons of God that used to sit on that divine council decided, you know what? we would like to have some family members in our image. And so we're going to make a pact. And we're, going to and we're going to go down and we're going to start our own families. We hate mankind, but we're going to raise up our own families. And guess where they come down? Mount Hermon in Bashan. Way up the northern, the northernmost border of the land of Israel, the land grant that God gave to Abraham, right up there in the land of Bashan. Who's the king of Bashan when you get over there into the times of Moses and all that? You have Og, the giant, the giant, right? The, those city names that are up there, those are all associated with the underworld. And when you get into Bashan, guess what? In the literature back then, it's called the gates of hell. Because they thought that was the entrance into the underworld. 
So no, there is, there is uh, no surprise then that when Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly ministry, what does he do? He takes his disciples and they go all the way up to Mount Hermon. They go all the way up there. And when he's up there, remember, that's when he says to Peter, where was he? He was at Caesarea Philippi. So I, I don't have pictures of it here, but, but Caesarea Philippi, all you have to do is Google that, and you can look at all these pictures. There's this big cave that goes down, and, it just, it, it, and, and they thought that was an entrance into the, the underworld. All these sacrifices that took place out of that, it was such a, a vile and evil place even the superstitious Gentiles were freaked out by it. They were like, we just can't go over there. That's evil. That's just, that's just terrible. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, let's go to Caesarea Philippi. And they're probably thinking, why? And there's, a, there's something going on with that. And so he goes up there. And that's when he says to Peter, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, well, some say you're Jeremiah or John the Baptist or one of the prophets. He says, who do you say that I am? And he says this, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, thou art Peter. And upon this rock, and you know what he's pointing at? The biggest mountain in the whole land area of Israel. On this rock, I'll build my church. Now, he's talking about the church of the remnant. He's talking about believing Israel. You know what he's saying? I'm taking over your territory. He's saying to all... See, the big picture is, he's not just talking to 12 guys in an empty field. All of the demonic host he is putting his finger in their chest and he's saying I'm taking all of this over by the way that's under Gentile control and you know what he's saying about that I'm taking the nations back I'm going to have it all and so now he is antagonizing them and he's saying and the gates of hell will not prevail Again, see, we used to think it was kind of the other way around. It's the gates of hell won't prevail against his church. He's saying, I'm taking all of this over. He goes back for Passover week, and guess what? At the end of that week, he's on the cross. You know what? We know the end of that story. For if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Yeah, he is. You know what he's doing? He is poking them in the chest to antagonize them and they're going let's put this guy to death I don't want to equate this with the cartoon but it's almost like the Lord said please don't throw me in the briar patch <laughs> okay only some of you are old enough to know what that reference is about okay but that's what God needed them to do and that's the redemption that does that so now, here they come. So when Moses and, and, and are coming up, you ever notice, again, I don't have the whiteboard, but when they come up out of Egypt and they come around, the easy thing would have been to just follow the coast around and come right on up into the land. But before they do that, remember they balked 40 years earlier because of the giants, these guys. And so God's saying, look, you got to know that when you get into the land, you got to deal with all these races of giants. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go outside the land. He says, all these over here, they're, they're related to them. But he says, these folks that are over here, don't bother them because they have already took care of the giants in their land areas. But you got this guy, Og, up, I mean, this, this Bashan area up here. Go up there and let's take care of them. And they go all the way up north and they defeat the giants up there. And then they get the go-ahead to come back down and cross over Jordan, go into the land. Of course, Moses doesn't do that. But guy number two takes over. And who is that? That's Joshua. They drive out. And you'll notice there's two different accounts in the Bible. I love it when skeptics look at this and they go, 
they got a deal, got verse over here, it says that God utterly destroyed them and he consigned them to death and he killed them all. And then over here it says, and, and you know, and they just, uh, you know, took them over and enslaved them and, you know, and they dealt with that. If you'll look at that, here's what you'll notice is the difference. If it's the giants, they utterly wiped them out. If it was normal inhabitants just living in Canaan, they just took the rule over them. He needed to wipe out the giants. Needed to have them done because they were unclean. Those giants are unclean. How does anything become unclean? One of the ways is by the forbidden mixture. You ever notice in the law it says don't take this kind of material and this kind of material and put it together. It was a forbidden mixture. You know what the giants were? They were a forbidden mixture at their very nature. They were unclean by nature. And so, uh, those, those, so, those, so, so you, have, you have these 200 sons of God. They come down on Mount Hermon. They make this pact. They, they cohabit with the daughters of men. They produce this race of giants. And here's what else that literature says. It says that they told men all of this forbidden knowledge for the ultimate goal of men wiping themselves out on the earth. So they're talking about all the weapons of warfare. If you ever notice, Israel has trouble. They come up against a, a certain people, the Philistines, and guess what the Philistines have? Iron chariots. And they're going, wow, where did, where did all of that come from? Well, we know where it came from. Now, in these notes, I give you, there's footnotes in there that will direct you back to some of this Second Temple literature that will tell you that they, and I don't know how accurate that is. It's not in your Bible. But they're actually talking about, here's the names. You had, you know, 10 bands of 20 or 20 bands of 10. I can't remember which way it went. But there was 200, and you have, and this group was responsible for teaching them about warfare. This group was responsible for teaching them about enchantments and spells. This group was talking, and if you think, well, wait a minute, that's not really real, is it? Enchantments and spells, necromancy, contacting the dead. You can't really do that, can you? Let me ask you a question. Why would God command for someone not to do that unless it could be done? I mean, it'd be like God making a rule saying, you cannot flap your arms and thou shalt not flap thy arms and fly to the moon. And you're going, okay, I can keep that one. I won't disobey that. You can't do that. He's not giving them commands on pain of death of trying to do something they cannot do. So, yeah, so they're teaching them about enchantments and spells and necromancy you've got another one that's talking that's talking to women about the art of making themselves alluring and all of that kind of business you know and then you've got uh, idolatry and you've got all this kind of business that's going on where did all that knowledge come from it came from these sons of God who were there at the creation of the world who used to be part of the divine council who understand the very fabric of creation and have been in on almost everything that's been going on. And they've got all this knowledge. Yeah. No. Angel, no. Yeah, angel's a job description and anybody can be an angel. That's why when you have an appearance of the Lord himself, we're going to talk about this in the second session. We have an appearance of the Lord himself doing something here. It would call it the angel of the Lord. You know what our apostles said? That's the one I serve. That's the one I serve. He said, I serve the angel of the Lord. He said, wait a minute, Paul. You're serving an angel? But we have to understand who the angel is. It's the Lord Jesus. There's more to it than that. I, just wait till the second session. There's more to it than that. Because what you have here, if I can give you this dilemma, am I almost out of time? I don't know. I, if, have they delivered? 
Okay, let me just do this and we'll stop and we'll see how far we get. Here's the dilemma. And I, I, found this, I found this old book that was written by, I guess this is really great. And um, he titled the book, The, the Two Gods in Israel. And you say, wait a minute, that's, that'd be polytheism. There, there's just one, the Lord thy God is one God. You know, we know all that. And that's true, all that's true. But you know what you have? You have the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Well, wait a minute. And then you have this angel of the Lord issue, which one moment talks about it like we would say that's an appearance of the sun. And then a verse later, it's talking about it like it's the father. Now, the Jewish people never thought of that as two gods. But this guy that wrote this book is a Jewish rabbi, and he goes, we have always understood this in Israel, and this has always been a bit of a conundrum. But until you understand the son and the father, you won't ever get this straight. So it is monotheism. But you know what? Those three are one, right? But yet you have this, but you have both of them acting and doing certain things within that. Anyway, we'll get to that in the second session a little bit because I think that's very interesting. When we come back, we'll pick up the third one, which is the one I really wanted to get to, third rebellion. And oh, by, oh, by the way, let me just finish this. So yeah, so you have Moses starting to wipe out the giants and then you have Joshua. Moses, remember, uh, the, the, the deal was, the prophecy was, you know, um, a prophet like unto Moses. So that was pointing back to Jesus. Joshua, that's the name, right? And now the third one is David, the man after God, God's own heart. So what happened? When Joshua comes in, the giants that can't stand, they all flee over into Philistia, over on the coast. Gath, remember that's where Goliath was from. They're all over there. And when David comes on the scene, he's responsible for wiping out the rest of those giants. But what has happened to those? Well, now we go to the inspired New Testament as a commentary that we didn't get details on back there. And he says, and those angels that left their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness awaiting the day of judgment. Dennis? I'm just quoting the verse there, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, he's talking about those 200. They're not angels, they are. Yeah, don't, don't think of an angel as a thing. Think of it as a job. Like, there's my mailman. Yeah, sure. That's okay. Okay, okay, that's a good question. Rick Davis, the vice president of the Bible Institute, who is not able to be here, but we used to, he used to, in fact, his wife Elaine said to me one time, if there's no female angels, why do the male angels have the ability to cohabit with the daughters of men? Why did God create them that way? What we did, I didn't know the answer back then. I used to say, that's a really good question. You should ask your husband at home, like the Bible says. Uh, so, but now, you know what? I know the answer to that. And here's the thing. Because of what they are, we'll do this in the second session. They are Elohim. Because they are Elohim, they do not have, as a natural state, a corporeal body. But they have the ability to manifest a corporeal, a corporeal body in every detail and then to leave that estate and go back to their original estate. And that would not limit them to just mimicking a human. That, if we get time, we'll do it. Y'all keep, keep making me go slow. <laughs> Y'all's fault. 
Okay. So they have the ability to do that. So it's not they were created with that. They have no corporeal body. They have no physical body. But they are able to manifest themselves with any physical form that is necessary for them to do whatever it is that they're doing. I was talking to John last night and I said, there's this book, I saw a reference when I was doing this work and, I, and a guy quoted a piece out of this book and I thought, I gotta get that book and it was called Two Marvelous Beasts, or not marvelous, that's not the word, it's, oh, not, not like the Harry Potter movie, Fantastic Beast, you know, it was like, but it was a word like that, it reminded me of that movie title and the guy was writing about Leviathan and Bohemoth in, in the biblical writers and non-biblical writers and how they were all talking about the same thing. And I thought, i got to get that book, but you can't get it anymore. I mean, it's just, it's just gone. It's just, you know, and I thought, oh, man. But uh, anyway, I thought that would be very, but he, was, he had made an allusion to that book, and I was trying to do the research on that. So anyway, I'm sorry, I got off track. So we'll come back and we'll do the next one and then we'll see how far we get. All right, so let's have a word of prayer for the meal and then go back. Which way do they need to go?